gentlemen and distinguished guests, good afternoon and welcome to the Royal and to the first day of summer. Okay, thank God you're going to be excited by this celebration. My name is Nicole Loretto, Vice President of Communications and Partnerships, and I want to welcome you to an exciting celebration of bright, creative, passionate, and very young researchers who are launching the Royal's Emerging Leaders Research Incubator in Mental Health. So today we will unmask the winners. And they were all worried because they thought they were going to come in with the masks. And we said no. C'est une journée exceptionnelle pour le lancement bien attendu de l'incubateur de recherche et de nos brillants jeunes chercheurs. But let me first introduce our special guests. I want to um, recognize um, our wonderful Madame Johnson, who, again, is a, who it is an immense pleasure and delight to have you among us today. You're an outstanding mental health advocate, famous author, and our wonderful former excellency. You have helped us elevate mental health research and shine a spotlight of innovative ideas that will change the future. It is only fitting that you are here today to recognize our next generation of leaders in research. Un grand merci parmi I would also like to acknowledge members of our board, we have Mr. David Sampi among us, several board members that I see, and actually there's so many of them that I won't name them, but welcome all of you today. Of course, I have to underline, uh, sincère salutation à notre président et chef de, de file, Georges Baber, also Dr. Zul Morali, who is the president of the Research Institute. And we have André Picard, journaliste renommé, top Canadian newspaper columnist, écrivain de plusieurs livres, one of Canada's most best known, insightful health and public policy observer of our times. Surnommé champion en santé mentale, and one that I really liked that I thought I didn't think first, healthcare hero. André nous amène au fond des questions de santé et de ce fait, nos valeurs. André, nous sommes ravis de t'avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui. Évidemment, des salutations distinguées à nos grands chercheurs. I'm not going to name the researchers, as André will have that honor. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of detail about the celebration. So with Andre's skillful talents, you will be introduced to our top young scientists who will put the, uh, the Royals Research Incubator on the map as they pursue their exciting ideas that will revolutionize how we detect, prevent, and treat mental illness. But before we introduce the researchers, let's hear from our favorite top neuroscientist, Dr. Zul Morali, who will explain how an impressive international selection committee chose the winners. Dr. Moran. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to officially launch today the Emerging Research Innovators in Mental Health Incubator Program. Um, we call it ERIM for short. And also to introduce you to the seven of the exciting winners who will be doing their cutting edge research here right at the Royal. The ultimate goal of the ERIM program is to enhance mental health research and capacity in Canada and by enabling the next generation of researchers to conduct highly innovative work that could impact the mental health treatment for tomorrow. They will get mentorship, salary support, grants for up to five years uh, and will allow these young scientists to grow and to foster their careers in, in a highly collaborative environment. They will become part of our family. I wanted just to take a moment to acknowledge our anonymous donors and their extraordinary and unique opportunity that they have enabled uh, through their generous, unprecedented contribution. Through their $6 million targeted investment in, uh, by the, our donors, they truly expose the Canadian value 
around improving and transforming our healthcare system um, through support for innovation uh, for the next generation in leadership. I wanted to take the moment on behalf of all of us to give a round of applause for the recognition for this enormous contribution that has uh, enabled us to be here today. So thank you. Our donors recognize that the young scientists need more than just good ideas. They need, also need resources to make their research happen. As you know, research grants these days are very difficult to get. Uh, and the success rate on the general is about 15%, one five. And these young scientists are fortunate in the sense that they'll have research grants also at the same time so that they can hit the ground running. So it's no point getting a car and not having the gas in it. This is going to be a full package. So they can move forward. This uh, award will empower the emerging scientists uh, to dedicate themselves fully to research. They will get the focus on discovering new ways to predict, to prevent, uh, and even to treat mental illness. Earring recipients will not only benefit from research mentorship, clinical mentorship, they will also have access to cutting edge technology such as our brain imaging center and repeated transcranial magnetic stimulation devices. These emerging scientists will have everything at hand uh, so that they can do the work that they need to. They truly will be in the driver's seat so that they are not confined by boxed ideas. They'll have a free, free opportunity to kind of think outside the box and move the field forward. These scientists were selected from a pool of applicants received from scientists across Canada and across the world. I want to extend a special thanks to our EGRIM selection committee uh, for their expert and rigorous uh, review of the applications. The selection committee consisted of directors or past directors of prestigious organizations such as the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, the US National Network of Depression Centers, the European Alliance Against Depression, and the Chief Scientist of Quebec, just to name a few. I have mentioned this often, but it's worth re-emphasizing that we are now with mental illness where we were with heart disease and with diabetes more than 100 years ago. We need curiosity-driven research um, and, and researchers who are going to move, who are eager to advance the field forward and, in mental health. Curiosity-based research is the only force that will bring about innovation, much needed innovation in mental health. To share a quote from our anonymous donors, curiosity is a driver of innovation and mental health needs a lot of it. There have been many news stories recently that have been very difficult for our community to take, but these seven young scientists that you're about to meet today, they are curious, they are energetic, they are extremely capable, and they bring to us hope. I have absolutely no doubt that these young men and women will help us usher, usher in a brighter future for mental health and men, uh, both in terms of research and care. So no pressure, young researchers, but without further ado, I'd like to uh, now welcome Dr. Uh, Andrew Picard to take the stage. Great, thank you, Dr. Mulley. Wow, good crowd. I sat down before anyone came in. It's very impressive. So one of the things I do, I'm, as you heard, I'm, uh, my daily job is uh, being a health columnist at the Globe and Mail, but I get involved and have my fingers in a whole bunch of pies. And one of the things I do, I've done for a few years now, is mentor uh, young scholars for the Trudeau Foundation. And working with really brilliant young people has taught me uh, a few important things. Uh, the most important thing is it's taught me that I'm not really very smart compared to all these people, but I, I knew that before. Uh, but it's also taught me that a little bit of support, uh, financial and otherwise, early in a career is really essential to, to building a good research career. And we don't support our young researchers enough. So that's, that's why I'm here, because I to send that message that this kind of program is, is really important. 
And the third thing that the, the scholars have taught me over the years is that researchers are really passionate about what they do. Uh, they work really hard, they're often hidden away in their labs, we don't know about what they do, but ask them a couple of good questions and you're going to get a fascinating story. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to sit each of them down and I'll introduce you to them very briefly, uh, ask about two questions that only have about five minutes each, and we'll talk a bit about their work and then they'll get a lovely award from Mrs. Johnson. So that's how it's going to work. Uh, les sept chercheurs que vous avez à les rencontrer aujourd'hui sont évidemment très impressionnants, très inspirants, très passionnés. Alors on va les parler très brièvement, quelques questions pour avoir une saveur de leur recherche. Uh, mais vous allez voir que les lauréats sont tous très très mérités. Now, ERIM is important, as I said, because it gives that all-important early career boost. That's what it's all about, to give them a, a hand, hand up uh, or a, a leg up on others that they're competing for for grants. Uh, you know, there's a lot of money out there to be had, at least in theory, and everybody needs a little bit of advantage, and that's what they're hoping to give them here at the Royal Ottawa. So, without uh, further ado, let me call up the first researcher, and uh, I guess this will be the big unveil. So we'll start uh, with Dr. Michael Bodner. Michael? Uh, Michael Bodner, I'm from Saskatchewan originally, moved to Montreal in 2005, where I completed two PhDs. You're going to say, why? First one was neuroscience, moved on to the clinical side because there was a passion for mental health research that started with imaging and then continued with wanting to help. And so that's my short little Twitter bio. Excellent. So two PhDs and underachiever. We've got yes. you. <laughs> so, so how does a small town Saskatchewan farm boy end up as a clinician, researcher, neuroscientist? That's going to be an interesting path. It's a, it's a very interesting path, I guess. Um, if I had to say how I got here, um, it was luck. <laughs> Writing letters, showing up. But then one of the main things is being able to apply for and receive funding. And I believe this is what the Ibram will allow us, allow all of us, allow myself to move forward, focus, do that research, and really concentrate. And I think as Dr. Morelli nicely pointed out, the best is like, it's very hard to, for researchers that are young to have both salary and research funding. And this award is absolutely brilliant in that it offers both at the same time. So from that little farm boy coming from Saskatchewan to have this opportunity, absolutely beautiful. And how, how did you find out about it? Um, there's people that do talk, and there's that thing called Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figured if you didn't have Twitter, maybe you didn't know about the internet. No, no, Facebook. Coming from Saskatchewan, that small town, there's no internet. <laughs> now, let, let's talk a bit about your work. Uh, you have a, what I found interesting about your bio is you have a really interest in patients. A lot of researchers hide in their labs and uh, do their work, but you have an interest in patients. Where, where did that come from? That's why you went back and did the second PhD. Exactly. So, so my research is, is really focusing in, I work with people with schizophrenia and the related psychosis, so psychosis in general. Um, yes, I don't sit in the lab, I don't sit behind a, a screen, I don't just type and do things, I interact. And that's my research. I like to develop, work with, and design, try to implement new therapies. And so my goal kind of here is that, is to come up with new therapies, individualized therapies, to allow people to have a, a better life ahead of them. So my primary focus is, like I said, psychosis, but then it's these negative symptoms. And just little on the side there, it's those that should be there that are not. It's what's absent, so let's say a general lack of motivation, or being able to have an easy flow of conversation. And I want to be able to create new therapies, I guess, to help these people achieve their life goals. And these life goals can be anything from just as simple as maybe doing the laundry, grocery shopping, to maybe even going back to school, completing school, finding a job, but at the individual level to help each person how they want to be helped. And when we hear new therapies, we're not talking about just drugs. No, 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 no definitely not. This is psychological. My work as a clinical psychologist, so it's going to be cognitive behavioral therapies, the cognitive remediation therapies combined in these bringing mindfulness, uh, acceptance, yoga has even been spoken about bringing all these things together and, and just working or bringing what's best for that person so that they feel better about themselves. They can move and why, why the interest in psychosis? I guess for me, the interest in psychosis is that um, it's. It's quite broad, in essence, 
there's no one set thing that works for one person. You can't just say psychosis and you know what it is. Each person presents something differently. So that's the challenge itself. Is that even providing therapy, the person comes in the door, you don't know what's going to actually happen until you meet that person. And that psychosis is just a beautiful thing to work with because you don't know what you get. Okay. So I think I made you work hard enough. So I think we're going to Jones and give you an award for that for your presentation. Thank you. So on va inviter maintenant la, la deuxième lauréate, euh, Dr. Sarah Tremblay, peut, peut rejoindre en avant, Sarah. Maintenant, on ne va pas vous forcer d'être aussi bavard que Michael, mais on va essayer. Okay. Alors, dites-moi un peu de votre, euh, votre background, de vos, vos études, comment vous êtes arrivée ici. Oui, donc je suis formée en neuropsychologie clinique à l'Université de Montréal. Puis par la suite, j'ai continué euh, au post-doctorat à euh, University College London, euh, à Londres. Et euh, par la suite, re revenu au Canada euh, à, à Cambridge, euh, à Toronto, euh, dans les dernières années. Je ne pense pas qu'on a le droit de dire, dire Cambridge ici. <rire> Alors, on veut, je veux vous parler un peu de votre recherche. J'ai vu dans votre bio, dans votre documentation, stimuler le cerveau de façon non invasive. Oui. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire? Euh, ça veut dire utiliser ce qu'on appelle euh, les, les champs magnétiques, en fait, euh, pour aller moduler l'activité du cerveau. Donc, euh, on peut utiliser dans différentes façons. La, la technique qu'on utilise le plus, c'est la Repetitive Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation. On n'a pas le beau mot en français pour, pour la décrire, donc la RTMS. Puis, ce que ça nous permet de faire, c'est, en fait, les, les gens ne savent pas vraiment que ça permet aussi de mesurer. Donc, on peut aller mesurer l'activité d'une région spécifique du cerveau pour ensuite aller la moduler, donc aller recalibrer, si on veut, l'activité du cerveau qui pourrait être un peu, euh, qui pourrait être anormale dans certaines régions euh, du cerveau. Donc c'est ça un peu l'idée. Je l'ai déjà essayé moi-même une fois avec les mains géants sur la tête, ça ne m'a pas rendu plus intelligent. Non, non. est-ce qu'on le fait pour arrêter de parler, on peut faire arrêter de... Oui, oui. Ouais. <rire> Mais euh, comment est-ce qu'on mesure, parce que j'étais intrigué par cette question, qu'est-ce qu'on mesure euh, des champs magnétiques? C'est quoi qu'on mesure? En fait, c'est qu'en allant stimuler le cerveau, on peut mesurer la réponse. Puis, euh, il y a différentes façons de mesurer. Euh, une façon la plus facile, c'est d'aller faire au niveau du cortex moteur, puis on est capable de faire bouger les jambes. Donc, c'est pas un immense mouvement, mais on est capable d'aller faire bouger, par exemple, le doigt d'une personne. C'est un index de l'excitabilité de la région qu'on stimule. Si on va à l'extérieur du cortex moteur, bien, là, on peut utiliser la neuromagie, par exemple, en combinaison avec la stimulation magnétique. Donc, on va stimuler, puis on va mesurer la réponse euh, obtenue. Et c'est utilisé pourquoi? Moi, j'ai fait un papier une fois sur le PTSD. On utilisait, est-ce qu'il y a d'autres raisons pour essayer cette méthode au lieu de, des médicaments, d'autres choses? En fait, en, en neurologie, c'est beaucoup utilisé aussi. En, en santé mentale, c'est utilisé surtout pour la dépression, mais ça peut être utilisé pour l'anxiété, pour le PTSD, la schizophrénie. Donc, euh, donc divers, divers euh, troubles de santé mentale peuvent être euh, touchés. Et le pourquoi? Pourquoi ça marche vraiment? C'est une bonne question. <rire> euh, mais en fait, l'aimant euh, est utilisé, euh, à, par exemple, à l'effet d'utiliser un, un champ électrique parce que c'est très vocable. Donc, on est capable de vraiment d'aller stimuler directement en dessous euh, d'où qu qu'on stimule. Puis, on peut aller activer euh, la région euh, très, très facilement. En fait, euh, l'aimant va passer au travers du, euh, du scat, donc euh, du crâne sans euh, t'altérer. Euh, donc, euh, le champ magnétique va aller euh, activer la région de cette façon. Et dernière question, ultimement, qu'est-ce que vous voulez achever avec cette recherche? Bon, j'ai été beaucoup formée dans la méthode. Donc, j'ai travaillé auprès de la population clinique, mais surtout au développement de, de nouvelles techniques. Puis euh, ici, c'est important de mentionner que le Royal a récemment fait l'acquisition d'une RTMS euh, qui est euh, à la fine pointe de la technologie. Donc, il y a seulement euh, environ cinq laboratoires dans le monde qui ont accès à cette technologie-là. Mais ce que je veux faire, c'est vraiment améliorer les traitements actuels. Donc, précisément réduire... Euh, la durée de nos traitements. Donc, de passer d'environ 30 à 45 minutes jusqu'à 3 à 5 minutes, euh, ce qui permettait de vraiment d'augmenter l'accessibilité euh, au traitement euh, pour les patients. Et il y a une clinique ici pour les soldats avec le stress post-traumatique. Il y a vraiment une, une demande ici au laboratoire. Oui, certainement. Ils sont que l'horizon est très positif, très, très excité. Et félicitations Merci. et bonne chance. Et Mme Johnson va vous donner un bon petit euh, cadeau. So, Rebecca, tell us a little about uh, your background, how you ended up here. Um, so, like Sarah, I did my um, 
PhD in neuropsychology, in clinical neuropsychology at the University of Montreal. And then um, I started studying sleep uh, there from, more from a basic science perspective. Um, then it was during my first postdoctoral um, studies that I did in, uh, at the University of Sydney in Australia, where I started working in mental health and, and really loved it. Um, and I came at the Royal for uh, a second postdoc and fell in love with the place, so I decided to, um, to stay here. And why, why sleep? Why not? <laughs> I, um, to be honest, it all started uh, mostly because of, a, I have to admit, an egoistical perspective. I'm just fascinated by sleep. I think it's, a, it's really kind of a mysterious state. There's a lot still to learn about sleep. Um, so that's initially what, what drove me into the field to start off with was my own curiosity. Uh, but once I got into it, I started realizing uh, all the implications that it has for for physical health and for mental health as well. So I, I came to um, really see sleep as a, um, a window to intervene and, and help people, get people better. And are you one of these people who doesn't sleep enough or you have a good sleep? I'm always ashamed to say that I'm actually a very, very good sleeper. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. okay, well I can't say cordonnier mal chaussé. <laughs> so tell me about, I was intrigued reading uh, about your research about this connection between sleep and mental health and cardiac health. What, what's the connection between those two, three big things? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so for, uh, from our field, the sleep has mostly been studied from the perspective of the brain, right? So most of our gold standard measures are based on brain activity. Um, but what's getting to interest me more and more is the interplay between different physiological systems while we're sleeping. So when we sleep, it's the whole body and the whole mind that sleeps, not just the brain. So um, we started looking at, uh, for example, how the heart sleeps um, and how does that relate to, uh, to brain function, respiratory functions, and then mental health. So for example, um, we recently found out that just by looking at transitions in heart rate during the sleep episode, we can dissociate between someone who's mentally well and someone who's going through depression, which to me speaks that there's something fundamental going on in the, in, in the body as a system rather than just um, in the brain. So do people with mental health issues, do they typically have sleep problems? Yes, um, very often that is the case. And I guess a lot of our um, the research that I want to do through ERIM is to really better understand that because I don't believe that there's a single profile of sleep disruptions that's linked to depression or anxiety disorders or bipolar disorder. I think we really need to start focusing on the individual and try to develop new tools to really understand the different um, profiles of sleep disturbances that people have and that interact with their mental illness because then we'll be much better equipped to develop tailored interventions for um, to, to help out these individuals. So the chicken and egg question, do you treat the sleep problem first or do you treat the mental health problem? Which one is the, the more important? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's indeed the, the million dollar question and, and I, I became uninterested in that question uh, from a, a certain perspective because in my view um, it is very clear now that there's a bi-directional effect between um, sleep and mental health um, but what we do know is that if you fix sleep then you help people get better and to me that's really what matters regardless of what started what. Um, sleep is um, one of the targets that, um, that we can use to try to improve both mental and physical health. Good. And last question, I want to ask you a bit about this program. There's a lot of funding opportunities out there, a lot of grants. How, how did you come to this one and what, what's different about it? Um, well, I guess to me, one of the, the really nice things was that it was um, based at the Royal and at the IMHR and a lot of the work that we want to do is um, also to build a stronger connection between the research groups and the clinical groups at Royal because um, there are such an amazing team of physicians and sleep technicians here at the Royal who are really expert at the kind of the crossroads of mental health and sleep, which is pretty unique. Uh, but there's four of them, <laughs> and we need to uh, try to get uh, develop new ways to increase access to um, assessments and, and treatments. So I thought that um, this uh, specific year of opportunity was uh, was also well aligned with that that kind of mission that we have to try to strengthen that connection between the clinical and the research world. 
Well, thank you and congratulations. I think as you walk around the hospital, everybody's going to tell you about their sleep problems. <laughs> thank you. So, Laurie, tell us a bit about your, your background. So, um, I'm an MD PhD from Finland. Um, I did my PhD looking at risk factors for anxiety uh, using PET imaging, which is a neuroimaging technique. And then I moved to Boston, where I um, learned to use a functional MRI imaging to look at the brain and heart. And now I'm here. <laughs> so, why do you come to Ottawa from Finland for the weather? <laughs> The weather is great, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so no, that's just a joke question. <laughs> so, uh, I'm interested, you're, you're a medical doctor and a PhD. Which, which order did you do them in and why, why did you do the two? So I was doing uh, uh, my MD first and then um, the way it works in Finland is you do uh, combined PhD and residency. So I fell in love with, with uh, research, and that has kept me going. Yeah. Good. And do you, do you miss the clinical side? Do you miss working the hands-on? Uh, yes, I do sometimes miss that, yeah. But I, 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 I do love uh, research even more, and I, I think life is short, and I have to do what I, I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Now, your research is in an interesting area, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So everybody wants to know why do some people get PTSD and some don't, even if they're in the exact same circumstances. And you can tell me, and I'll keep it secret till you publish it. But I'm interested in giving that, that that secret answer. I don't. Yeah, that's that's the million dollar question. I think I, I don't know. I don't know that we know that really yet. And could you are you going to help figure? Can imaging help us figure that? Out? Yeah, I hope so. So neuroimaging is one of the only ways to look at living brain and, and give us information that we wouldn't get in any other way. So yes, uh, uh, I, I, th I think that th that's, that's the best chance we have right now. So I was just visiting uh, before this uh, a PET fMRI, you mm -hmm. quit an impressive machine here, one of the only, you know, one of the only ones in the world. Uh, what kind of, uh, do you get excited when you see a machine like that at the opportunities with the, the work you do? Uh, it must be quite exciting. It's, it's, very, it's, it's a very unique uh, opportunity to use one of these machines. There are probably a few dozens of them in the world. And now, uh, at the Royal, I mean, I don't know any other mental health center that would have a PET fMRI uh, scan uh, and to bring, bring the, the clinicians and the researchers on the same roof. I, I think that's very unique. Uh, and what, what can you learn from that machine that you can learn from other stuff? So, um, so pet, pet imaging allows you to look at uh, um, the neurochemistry of the brain, say uh, serotonin or dopamine systems, whereas uh, MRI and functional MRI allows you to look at uh, brain activity. So that doing those at the same time allows you to look at how um, the brain activity during a uh, cognitive or, or uh, emotional process is, is related to these uh, neuro transmitters or, or other uh, neurochemical neuro processes. And is there something you think about PTSD specifically that you're going to find out? Yeah, well, uh, we, so unlike many other uh, me mental illnesses, I, I think we don't really understand much about the, the uh, neurotransmitter systems that are involved in, in, in PTSD, and that's why I want to really focus on PTSD. And what I'm specifically going to look at is, is fear learning and how, how dopamine system is involved in fear learning from di different perspectives. That's you. So I think it's time for you to get your award. Uh, thank you for for participating. <laughs> Oui, donc euh, j'ai fait en fait ma maîtrise en psychologie à l'Université de Montréal, puis par la suite euh, je suis allée poursuivre mes études en psychologie à l'Université McGill, euh, ce qui m'a amené à euh, Boston, euh, continuer avec un postdoctorat là-bas à Harvard Medical School, euh, puis euh, me voici ici aujourd'hui <rire> pour la suite.
Montréal est bien représenté aujourd'hui, il me semble. Oui. Ouais. Alors, euh, j'ai lu un peu sur votre recherche. Ça m'a intrigué le mot, c'est quoi transdiagnostic? Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire? Oui, en fait, euh, son, donc mes recherches vraiment s'intéressent à essayer d'améliorer euh, les traitements de remédiation cognitive qui sont offerts aux personnes qui vivent avec un problème de santé mentale. Euh, puis en fait, euh, je ne sais pas si vous, si vous le savez, mais souvent quand une personne va développer un problème de santé mentale, non seulement elle va avoir des, des symptômes cliniques reliés à la maladie, mais elle va aussi voir certaines de ses habiletés cognitives euh, qui vont diminuer. Euh, donc ça peut être par exemple euh, l'attention, ce qui nous permet de vraiment être concentré quand on est en classe, ou la mémoire qui est vraiment utile dans notre travail. Euh, puis en fait, euh, jusqu'à maintenant, il n'y a pas vraiment euh, de, de médicaments qui ont été euh, développés, qui sont efficaces pour aider les patients avec leurs troubles cognitifs. Euh, puis il y a une, euh, un traitement en ce moment qui semble être le plus efficace, qui s'appelle la réalisation cognitive. Euh, puis jusqu'à maintenant, la réalisation cognitive, euh, les recherches qui ont été faites, se sont faites seulement sur certaines populations euh, isolées, donc avec seulement un certain diagnostic clinique, donc la schizophrénie ou la dépression, mais séparément. Donc, euh, quand j'utilise le terme « transdiagnostic », c'est qu'est-ce que j'ai envie de faire, c'est au lieu de développer un traitement très général qui focus seulement sur une population clinique, euh, les différents diagnostics cliniques peuvent avoir aussi les mêmes symptômes. Donc, moi, j'ai envie vraiment de développer des traitements qui focusent sur euh, les symptômes spécifiques euh, cognitifs euh, et un peu euh, pas trop m'attarder là au euh, diagnostic clinique. Okay. Et c'est quoi les priorités dans ce domaine? Les priorités. Qu'est-ce euh, qui est le plus important pour la population? Mais en fait, c'est que quand une personne a des problèmes avec son attention ou sa mémoire, c'est vraiment difficile pour elle, même une fois que les symptômes cliniques sont traités, de pouvoir retourner à l'école, de pouvoir retourner au travail. Donc, euh, si on réussit à développer des meilleurs traitements pour aider les patients avec leurs problèmes cognitifs, c'est vraiment comme ça qu'on va pouvoir arriver à vraiment améliorer euh, la qualité de vie des patients et les aider là, avec la, la réinsertion sociale. Donc, c'est ça le but ultime. Là. Mais encore, ce n'est pas juste les médicaments. Non, exactement. Donc, euh, la réinsertion cognitive, c'est vraiment un traitement qui est plutôt, euh, ce que je dirais, psychosocial. Euh, puis, euh, ça. éventuellement, peut-être, il va y avoir des molécules qui vont être développées, qui vont pouvoir aider, mais pour l'instant, c'est vraiment plus une niveau psychosocial que, que je m'attends. Et ça m'intéresse de savoir qu'est-ce que vous pouvez faire avec une bourse green que vous ne pouviez pas faire avant. Oui, mais en fait, c'est vraiment une occasion en or, c'est innovatif parce qu'on peut avoir vraiment les moyens de bâtir notre propre programme de recherche. Euh, donc, en fait, je vais pouvoir euh, vraiment me concentrer sur les questions qui me tiennent à cœur, puis pouvoir développer là, euh, également euh, des traitements qui vont pouvoir aider les patients à améliorer leur qualité de vie. Et puis le point de vue un peu plus personnel ici, pour moi, c'était l'occasion de pouvoir revenir au Canada. Donc j'étais à Boston les deux dernières années, donc je suis vraiment heureuse de pouvoir revenir dans mon pays et pouvoir faire les recherches ici au Royal. Donc c'est ça. Puis aussi, je devrais mentionner que c'est vraiment une opportunité de pouvoir travailler avec plein d'autres jeunes chercheurs, euh, super intelligents, super motivés. Donc c'est vraiment très stimulant comme environnement pour euh, commencer sa carrière. Oui, on n'a pas parlé de ça à date, la complicité, c'est important. Oui, on va pouvoir s'aider, travailler ensemble, collaborer. Donc, euh, je regarde vraiment, euh, j'ai vraiment de voir qu ce que le futur nous réserve. Et on parle de votre génération, l'interdisciplinarité est beaucoup plus importante. Mm -hmm. Est-ce que c'est vrai? Oui, je crois que c'est vrai. Puis en fait, c'est une super occasion qu'on a de pouvoir travailler. Donc moi, j'ai vraiment un bagage plus au niveau de la psychologie. Mais on a ici euh, des experts en neurosciences, des experts en médecine. Donc, ça va être vraiment intéressant de pouvoir travailler tous ensemble. And let me ask you one last question in English. Yes. Uh, people will go, why is, she, why is she coming from Harvard to Ottawa? Is Canadians who <laughs> have an inferiority complex? Why come from Harvard? You shouldn't. <laughs> oh, okay, so as I said, for me it was really an opportunity to be closer to uh, my family and my friends. Uh, but also, it's not that easy to start your career as a young researcher when you're at Harvard. Uh, it's very hard, you need to get a lot of grant. And I felt that the opportunity here at the Royal was just a very unique one where I can have money for my salary, money for my research, and I don't have to stress too much about getting the next grant in the six next month. I can have like another year or two before I can get another grant to do more research. Et merci beaucoup, Madame Johnson, pour yes. venir. So I'm going to ask you the same as the others. Give us a little big flavor of your your career today. Um, so, I was born in Poland, uh, that's not really relevant to my career, but I think sometimes it is because people ask me about my accent. Um, 
but I grew up in Edmonton, so that's where I started my uh, sort of academic trajectory, if you will. And then I moved to Halifax, where I studied depressed gerbils. Yep, such a thing exists, apparently. Are there any that are not depressed? Oh, it's not depressed. I, I live in a lab, you guys. Um, and then I moved to uh, briefly to Montreal to work, and then I did my PhD actually here at the Royal. And then I did my first postdoc in Calgary, then my second one at McGill, and now I'm back. Okay. And you're actually working here. I am. So the kind of unique part for me is that I took over my PhD supervisor's laboratory, so I have mega imposter syndrome, but um, <laughs> it's really wonderful to be back here amongst this really supportive community that I sort of know, but that's also evolved a lot. So it's, it's fun and exciting for me to be back. Now, your research focus, you do a lot of work with youth and depression. That's right. So, one of the big questions we have is, is there more depression in youth today, or are we just better at, at measuring it? You know, that's a really interesting question. I don't know if I have an amazing <coughs> answer for it. I think... Pressure's on, pressure's on. I know, right? So, we, we need collaborators to answer these questions. I think, to a certain extent, we are better at measuring depression, but we also have a slight change in uh, culture where people are a lot more willing to um, come forward and seek help. Do I still think we have a ton to do? Yes, we do. Um, however, there are a lot of pressures on teens nowadays that didn't exist in the same way that they used to a couple of years ago with uh, cyberbullying and pressures of university being so extreme that I do think some of these more mental health issues are quite prevalent in our youth, and especially within the college-aged youth, where they're going from, you know, a nice, comfortable high school environment to all of a sudden being thrust into university, where there's a thousand other students, they're all competing for these grades, and they don't necessarily know how to always handle that. So, my long-winded response is, yes, maybe there's a bit more, yes, maybe we're better at diagnosing, but I still think we have a lot to do. And there's a lot more awareness now, especially among young people. Do we risk sort of pathologizing normal emotions by talking about depression and, and these stresses all the time? Um, I think there's never really a risk to talking more about mental health issues. I think sometimes uh, you do risk um, maybe normalizing certain abnormal behaviors because they're always so prevalent. So I think we have to be careful with our, our language. But I really do think that more talking is, is really not a negative of a thing, at least in my opinion. Okay. But how we talk is important. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And, and being very open with what the expectations of treatment can be and what the avenues of treatments are and taking um, the patient's perspective into our account. It should be um, a bi-directional conversation with the client, the patient, our community um, as, as a whole. And you talk uh, not only about specific research, but you're interested in reforming the mental health system. Well, I think I'll leave that to uh, Dr. Ian Mannion, who's uh, <laughs> much more um, well-versed than I am. But I mainly focus on looking at the brain. So what, what I do in my laboratory is look at brain electrical activity, uh, neuroimaging, to better understand specifically the depressed brain and what effects to various kinds of interventions. And in, in my youth uh, group, I look at aerobic exercise, I look at stimulation therapy, I look at pharmacotherapy, to see what effects do those interventions have on the brain. And really why I think this is important is because the more we understand about the brain, we increase the possibility of personalizing intervention. So at one point, we hope to be at a phase where we can look at our um, brain imaging markers along with our clinical markers and say to um, you know a teenager, hey, you're probably going to do well on this kind of pharmacotherapy, or maybe you'll be really responsive to exercise, but I think until we understand the brain better, it's a little bit difficult to incorporate some of these clinical tools in um, a really compelling fashion. So we've got a ways to go. So there's a lot of hit and miss now. Oh, I mean, that's one of the big things that I think clinicians uh, struggle with a lot. And um, there's, there's many researchers here at the Royal that are uh, trying to really uh, tackle that. Dr. Pierre Grier is a great example um, where he's, he's trying to accelerate response effectively. So we, we really want to shorten 
the duration that people are suffering and, and the reason they suffer is because we're not particularly great at um, really predicting who will do well on what. There's a lot of guesswork, there's a lot of trial and error, and what that translates to is suffering. Yeah. So we talk a lot about personalized medicine now, but it usually relates to cancer, to heart disease. You seem to be talking about personalized medicine for, for mental health issues. Absolutely, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I think uh, we already have some of these great tools. So even in my own laboratory, what we have found is that there's certain brain um, electrical profiles that allow us to uh, make pretty good predictions as to somebody who will be responsive to Prozac, for instance. I think we're not great at capitalizing on some of the research that already exists and incorporating that within our clinical practice. Um, and I do still think we have a ways to go to personalizing mental health uh, interventions, but that's the goal of my work. Excellent. And I know you gave a shout out to Dr. Mannion, who does great work with young Absolutely. people, but uh, I'm sure you'd appreciate all the help you can get. Absolutely. Uh, so, great. So thank you, and Mrs. Johnson has a wonderful <laughs> So you know the drill now, you've been watching the other victims. Exactly. So tell us a bit about your, your background. Uh, sure. So like, I'll start like Natalia did. I'm from Prince Edward Island. Very proud of that. Um, I did my undergraduate work there, and then I moved and did my master's uh, degree at Carleton University, so in Ottawa, on animal models of stress and depression, and then I switched to do human-based neuroscience, my PhD again at Carleton University. Um, I took a couple years where I left academia and did research uh, at a national organization, more towards informing policy, um, but I'm, I'm really happy to be back here today and moving back into an academic role. And what's more interesting, uh, policy stuff or research? Research. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah, absolutely. Being creative, and it's really exciting. Now, being creative, I hear you're a very good singer as well. <laughs> this came up over lunch. I did not say that. <laughs> no, but you, you have a, you're a trained singer. You're very good. We know that. Now, you, you study... Uh, an interesting area, a very topical, timely area, uh, mental health impacts in uh, Indigenous communities and residential school survivors in particular. Can you tell us a bit about what, what are the effects of trauma like that, like being taken away from your family and put in a school, what are the effects of trauma on the brain? Yeah, well we actually, um, so I'm not a brain imaging person per se, so but um, we often focus our research um, on the children of survivors and grandchildren of survivors. So what we're typically looking at um, when we're doing this work is really the intergenerational impact of trauma. So we're looking to see that the effects of trauma, such as the residential schools, do not stop at the person who experienced them directly, but continue to impact the subsequent generations. And so um, biological uh, health research in this area um, has been very limited. Um, so a lot of times we're looking at um, data that is more psychosocial. So some of our findings do show that while there's been extreme resilience in these communities as well, we are seeing that youth who have a parent who went to residential school, um, they show higher levels of distress and suicide ideation and attempts compared to the First Nations youth who do not have a parent who went to residential school. So we're certainly seeing the, the trauma being passed down to generations. Um, and what we would like to do, and an initiative that I've been invited on, is to move forward with biological health research that some of the same advances done in uh, more Western-based science could potentially be included in Indigenous communities. Um, this, this important project will be led by Thunderbird Partnership Foundation and National Indigenous Organizations will be Indigenous-led. Um, and I think it could be really important, but of course we'll lay the groundwork first and, um, and approach it in a culturally appropriate way. And I'm doing an event tonight at the Museum of Nature with Carol Hopkins of Thunderbird Foundation. Oh, wow. I'm going to talk about these so issues she's in more detail. This project. Yeah, if people are more interested in, in that issue. Oh, great. But what, what's the impact of trauma? Is it epigenetic? Is it cultural? Is it learned behavior or unlearned <coughs> behavior? What, what? Well, that's, yeah, that's a great question. I think it can be a combination. So there's, of course, um, when we're talking about the transmission of trauma, um, there can be psychosocial processes happening if someone didn't um, 
learn how to parent. It's difficult to parent themselves. Um, but certainly, epigenetics is something that has come up in our conversations initially surrounding this project quite a bit. Um, it's, it's my understanding that our knowledge of epigenetics is very consistent with Indigenous ways of knowing, that our environment can shape the way our genes express. And so this is something that the group has expressed interest in learning more about and potentially pursuing uh, the way that our environment can affect our genes and not just the person who experienced the trauma, but the next generations. And working with Indigenous people, that's their special things that, that researchers have to take into account. Talk a bit about that, about the respect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, first of all, all of my research that I've done, I'm, I'm I'm a non-Indigenous person, and it's all led by Indigenous people. So my main collaborator, Dr. Amy Bombay, she's a professor at Dalhousie University, but she's from Rainy River First Nation, and she started asking questions about residential schools um, based on her familial experience. And so um, certainly it's important that the questions are going to benefit the communities, that there are questions the community themselves have, and any projects that we move forward with will be decided on by communities. So it's a level of you know setting a relationship and groundwork first and ensuring that the work you do will benefit the community members. And, and finally, talk to me a bit about, uh, flowing from that answer, what is the role of researchers and clinicians in advancing reconciliation? That's a big question. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that uh, it's, it, first and foremost, I think we need to be knowledgeable. I think many um, people don't fully understand colonization in the, in the past, so I think that's a starting point. A starting point is having these conversations and, and, um, and talking about this today, and it's um, National Indigenous Peoples Day today, and so um, it's, an important, it's an important thing that we all learn and ask questions, and I think that could be a really important starting point. Yeah, and you're right, we have to use words like you know, colonialism and, and their impact and know that residential schools were around as late as 1996. We exactly. forget that this isn't a, a centuries-old issue. No, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you to all seven uh, recipients. And Ms. Johnson has a prize for you. How wonderful to hear from our, just our emerging scientists. It's uh, an absolutely amazing opportunity to hear what we can do for mental health. So I'm looking forward to being able to see what you do down a bit. Oh, there we go, for short people. Let me first thank the individual or individuals behind the incredible gift that are allowing researchers early in their career to flourish. Next, I want to congratulate the recipients who will uncover, explore, and advance our knowledge in the vast cauldron of mental health and mental illness. Broadly speaking, every Canadian can benefit. David Goldblum, in a recent conversation, suggested the frequently reported statistic that one in five Canadians suffers from mental health problems should in fact be one in one. Mental illness in our families, friends, neighbors, work colleagues, or even the homeless person begging on the street impacts our lives and our society. No one wants to live with depression, anxiety, serious mood disorders, PTSD, or any other illness. Personne ne veut souffrir de la dépression, l'anxiété, PTSD, trouble de l'humeur, ou aucune autre maladie mentale. Coupled with the pain of the illness is the fear of disclosing the problem. There is still stigma attached to mental illness, although we have made great strides. Three weeks ago, I was at the Difference Makers Gala in Toronto put on by CAMH, Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. They raised $2 million in a single night. We don't have the same resources in Ottawa, so the gift we are celebrating today is highly significant. The first Difference Maker to speak described overwhelming depression and anxiety that turned into psychosis. It was a terrifying feeling of not being able to control his thoughts and not wanting to admit his problem, even to his family. He was on the cusp of a suicide attempt when his wife, wife forced him to go to the hospital. Il était à l'oreille de se suicider quand son épouse l'a conduit à toute vitesse à l'hôpital. The psychiatrist that admitted him, somebody like Zou, the psychiatrist that admitted him was casual despite the man's extreme distress. Hmm, he said. You have psychosis, so let's treat that first. It was the word treat 
the sense of possibility that he could be cured that overwhelmed him. Once we have the psychosis under control, we can treat the rest, the psychiatrist added reassuringly. There was not a dry eye in that ballroom as this man spoke. It took several months of intensive treatment and hospitalization, but the difference maker who spoke that night has been well for many years. You recipients today are difference makers. We are all here today to congratulate you and wish you success.